Back in the middle of uh, 2015, I was approached by a colleague who had linkage with the uh, Metro State here in town. And they have a geology group there. It was actually, I think there were probably about 40 people in the room, but I was asked to present a, a, a career talk, which for me was interesting because my original education and a lot of my experience has been in the geophysical front. So standing in front of a room full of young aspiring geologists was sort of an interesting, not challenge, but it was sort of like, uh, if I'm going to do this right, I'd probably have to think about it a bit as opposed to being, if I, if I was put in front of a room of geophysicists, I could talk about probably 10 different subjects for half an hour because I've been doing it for 50 years. A geologist is sort of like, hmm, particularly with regards to a career, because that's important. All the rest of it is, is debating points, right? But when you talk about what somebody's going to do with their life. So this is where this first got put together. And I thought in 2015, that the topic of after the storm was, was a suitable one to try and capture then, because there was a lot of sputtering optimism, I guess I would call it, that the industry after the, uh, the depression of the first half of the decade we had to be getting better, right? Had to be getting better. Well, we're still waiting. It's still getting better. But so I said, hey, I can keep that slide there. Uh, just gonna. I, I think some of my Canadian friends were cursing me recently because of some storm that came out of Colorado, and I think we had something they called it a hyperbissel or something like this. So it's sort of like, well. It may not go on forever, but definitely there's, uh, they're not letting up. And so I think, as Sarah touched on, the cycles that our industry naturally has gone through, whether we like it or not, uh, permeate down through right to the individual level. And that's one of the takeaway messages, I think, that what I wanted to convey to these students and to you is that you have to be prepared as Sarah touched on, is the fact that you are dealing with uh, an unstable uh, business from the point of view of just how how it works. And it isn't always poor choices on the part of the people running it. Just there's some things that happen that we really can't control. But anyways, we'll start. See what you think. I, uh, had, I definitely had fun doing this. Um, what I'll first do is talk a bit about what is the business. I'm not going to assume some of the older people here would, would find this redundant. Uh, the information is reasonably up to date, but some of you probably haven't been exposed too much about this. And say, who are we? What is, what is actually this as a business entail? And where, of course, do we spend money? Because as Sarah touched on, this is where you may actually have to go to work. Uh, one young man after the Metro talk came up to me and he said, he says, if I said I would go work in a really dangerous place, do you think I could get a job? <laughs> you know, I just thought that is, that is a really interesting, difficult question to be asked. <laughs> because, of course, if you're working for a major, all the alarm bells go off and say, well, you shouldn't be working in places like that. Other guys, other companies would just say, well, hey, you, whatever's there. So... This is a this this comes out of the S and P uh, stats from they, they pushed them out in January just before the PDAC, so it's re it's relatively recent, and there's this very predictable testosterone game between Australia and Canada as to who's actually spending a bit more, but both both of those countries clearly are the big winners for exploration budgets over a billion dollars. It's from the U.S. currency for both of them. Uh, the U.S. isn't far behind. It, it looks like there's a lot being spent in Russia and China, and there probably is, but it's not really part of the Western world sort of spend. So, but it is tabulated because when they're looking at particularly future production, um, a pound of copper coming out of Russia is given as much importance as a pound of copper coming out of Chile. It just uh, doesn't really matter to the world where that comes from. Diamonds are about the only ones that seem to have a flavor of political correctness. Um, I've already mentioned about gold. There is a little bit of ambiguity 
with the terms majors and juniors. Uh, some people I see like to just leave it at two. Uh, the S&P people seem to embrace also an intermediate. So majors, of course, are like your BHPs, the Rio Tintos, the Valets. Intermediates, there's probably more in the gold space, but it'd be groups like Kinross, I am gold, you know, these are groups that actually have production, uh, and the money they spend on exploration is probably income that they generate from their own operations. The juniors, on the other hand, tend to be the groups that I really like to think of them as pretty much totally going to the equity markets or private funding. And so they're very much dependent on the whims of investors, uh, sometimes individual investors or groups of investors. So these historically have been our, our major employers for geoscientists. The spend right now, uh, it's a statistic, and there is timelines associated with this, but you can see based on the uh, chart on the left, over half of the budgets are going into late stage or mine site. So if you're looking for employment, there's probably, this is where a lot of the jobs are going to be. You're going to get a job on a, on a uh, drill off on a deposit in Nevada, or you're going to go work in a mine in Ontario, and that's probably better than 50-50 chance that that's where you will see employment. Uh, who spends the money is uh, dominated a bit more now by majors. I know a decade ago, majors and juniors actually were slugging it out, and you can see the intermediate category there. They're coming in around a billion. And that 2.9, my understanding is that's money that's actually raised on the market. That's separate from the money that a BHP takes from its profits and spends on expiration, or Rio Tinto spends on expiration. They publish information about that, but they're not going to the market to raise those funds. The one that gets uh, somewhat depressed, it doesn't seem terrible, but there's reasons why it's worrisome, is, is the grassroots or greenfields. That is on a, a, a long, slow, but well-defined decrease over the last 20 plus years. Um, some of you, well, probably not too many in this room right now, but when John Horansky, um, one, of, one of those people I call with the enlarged frontal lobes, uh, John came and was the SEG Distinguished Lecturer and spoke here at Mines in 2008. He spoke of the importance of Greenfields exploration, but that was to me like the little Dutch boy you know, trying to put his finger in it, <laughs> just didn't have any impact. Uh, and I noticed the current president of the SCG, Doug Kerwin, in his January missive, is talking about issues like that as well. And again, it, I don't think there's anybody listening to, to the technical community about this. The investors speak with what they feel is the where they're going to portion risk. And right now, uh, the advanced projects and and mindset if you got them is not important to these people. The spend, we are seeing, a, fortunately, a bit of a bump, but we had certainly a lot more. That's a bazooka. Um, here's the big peak here, over $20 billion. And the next graph is actually going to be the, the more depressing one, not to depress, but to, to try and calibrate, is that we did have a real bucket of money go through the system huge amount of money. Um, it was interesting from my business perspective, we actually saw more income down here because we were very much attached to the uranium business at the time. And that basically went through the system a bit sooner. So in terms of gold spend in particular and base metals, uh, that was more 11 to 12. Then the big tank, um, this is actually minerals index prices to track the costs that are being the, are these bars actually. So we're actually down here. Uh, I'm not sure why they, the S&P had some color problem with the PowerPoint. <laughs> it's not gold, it's, it's everything. So it's a global, global spend. And uh, so it is coming back, but there's still some turbulence. This, uh, I haven't seen uh, uh, there's, there's one person in the world that tabulates useful information on how money is spent that at least shares it publicly, and that's a guy called Richard Shoddy in Melbourne. And Richard put this out around the time of the Keystone meeting, 14, so it hasn't been updated. But what's telling is 
is Richard is actually tracking what's found with what the money that's been spent. And this is at, at the heart of the problem that the industry faces, is that more and more money is being spent, but less was actually being recovered. Now Richard, he's a sly little fox. See these little gray things in here? What Richard says is that a dollar spent here in 2005, it may take three years before you actually find that deposit. And so he's trying to buffer it. And I asked him once, I says, is that really true? And he says, no, but people like to think it is. <laughs> so it's, it's an effort to try and, that's why he uses the, the abbreviation est, estimated. And I actually, this graph now being five years old, and I saw him at the PDAC, and I was going to put that in front of him and say, right, what about all these huge discoveries you predicted? Have you actually seen them? Because ultimately, we're judged by our success, our ability to actually return dollars to the investors, to the companies that we're employed by. Uh, local guy here who also does the trendology, but in a slightly different way, and it's, it's actually pretty cool, is Doug Silver. He presented this in Anchorage a couple of years ago, and he's showing the equity cycles, values of the companies. Because if the company isn't worth anything, they probably can't raise any money. And so when their uh, total share price is, is, is depressed, they're probably in the doldrums. It's, not, it's only when they start to get decent um, share price value that they can go out and raise money on those shares. Otherwise, they lose control of the company. So this may be probably the first good one showing the cycles. Because with the flow of money also is opportunity, it's employment, it's people's willingness to spend. And this goes back to 1990, which is a fairly good chunk of time. Market capitalization of major mining companies. In 2011, BHP was over uh, almost a quarter of a trillion dollars. But you can see uh, back in 2016, is well below 100 million. So big deflection in value. Even though they're selling a lot of iron ore and stuff like that, this is, the, this is what the market regards them in terms of value. Because it's the future returns that they're interested in, not the ones that are predicted, say, flowing out of the hammer sleeve, the iron ore. They, uh, the investors know all about that, so they don't really give you much credit for that. Uh, the juniors, this is Doug's, Doug Silver's uh, uh, statistics on births and deaths. And there's a lot more juniors just going under the waves than there are appearing. It's, it's interesting. I talked to a colleague a couple of days ago, and he was referring I me mean, to two people that are actually running juniors. That the bit like Sarah, that they're 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 not economists, they're not engineers, they had no background in the business, other than one one lady was raised on her her mining engineer father's knee and she learned the business when he passed away she got opportunities and properties and basically ran with it as sort of like I got lemons I'm gonna make lemonade and uh, so getting people in from outside our business particularly running companies I think the techni technical part of it is probably harder but I think there's pe people with business acumen and the ability to sell things that don't have to have a geoscience or engineering background. They have to be honest, obviously, but you know, you can usually got that. Here's the Greenfields story. Um, what the Greenfields expend is, is in the uh, ochre color, and clearly the companies are far more comfortable at all levels spending on sure things. The problem is the sure things have very little upside generally. It's the Greenfields is where we're going to find the next Olympic Dam, the next Escondida, the next Divec, that's going to require effort in places that effort hasn't been spent before. And a large part of that is, is up here. People have to think, have time to think. And I don't see the industry, unfortunately, spending a lot of time <laughs> emphasizing that issue. So the explorers, where do the current crop who are out there running around, you might say your competition, I mean, if half of them up and died tomorrow, you'd all have jobs immediately, right? You're probably all going to have jobs anyways because there is a, a, a 
an exodus going on that's pretty significant. But in terms of even in the last 20 years how things have changed, BHP, when I left them in 1990, we had 42 offices and over 750 staff worldwide. Now they have about five offices and definitely left less than 100 people, and it's all focused on copper, at least in new expiration. And I've heard of recent that the oil industry is behaving somewhat in this way as well. It's even though oil prices are coming back, there's a hesitancy to return to staffing levels and expenditure levels that occurred five before 2014 when oil prices tanked. So a lot of the companies are becoming much more conservative in terms of how they actually approach generating new resources. But you say, but your reserves are running out and you're not finding enough new stuff. What's going to happen? Well, my, my younger son joined United about four years ago now, and they have 12,000 pilots. And he was in a class of, I think, 30 out at state, the old Stapleton Airport, where the United still has their training facility. And he said they need something like 1,200, 1,500 pilots a year, but they're only training like 40% of that. It's unsustainable. But there's many businesses that if you look at what they're actually doing and putting money into, there's simply not enough resources going into it to, you know, 10 to 15 years out to be able to say that business is still going to be there. And I think minerals exploration has an element of that in terms of resources, in terms of people. But it's what they're willing to spend money on is the issue. This is a guesstimate. I talked to uh, some people like Murray Hitzman and a few others as to how many people are actually engaged in exploration, minerals exploration, geoscience. Canada and the US, the spitball was about 2,000. Australia, there looks to be uh, just under a thousand. South America is kind of hard to get a number on because if they don't belong to societies and stuff, it's hard to know who's actually out there. But you put down 300. Europe puts a lot of money into various interesting issues in minerals exploration, <coughs> particularly in places like Africa. But the actual number of two scientists isn't huge, and there's quite a few in Africa scattered around the traps. No real idea in, in the former Soviet Union or China, um, but there's probably a lot, but most of them are, are going to be captive inside the countries they're working in. So they don't really enter into the equation and look at what Western companies are doing. So when I had the opportunity to do this Metro story, I went out and contacted about 80 colleagues, of which about 65 responded. And I said, what would you tell a room full of young geoscientists? And I'll summarize that here, but I, it was interesting for me because a lot of them were sort of older gentlemen like myself, and I had figured out there's about 2,500 years of experience. And so I said, you may not want to believe me, but I said, there were a lot of people who actually went into putting this uh, set of thoughts together. So trust me. Two things I found after I presented that that were very, very valuable, and uh, I had a chance to talk to Hitzman at the uh, Keystone and he, he agreed, because he said he actually put these in front of his uh, graduate students. But if you haven't seen these uh, articles, you should track them down. I can help Zach make them available. They are ACG publications, and they're, those guys are very anal about how they distribute stuff. A lot of things are hard to find. Uh, but what basically, the first one, the snow and Juras paper, in 2002, Basically, these two gentlemen described how the industry got where it was following World War II, what the issues were, what the successes, what the failures were, and what would likely happen if nothing changed. And to a 98% to a certainty, nothing has changed since 2002. So their predictions are still extremely relevant for what's happening now. So. This is, uh, these are things that people like you should be aware of. The other one who took a slightly more uh, individualistic look was Paul Bardos. Um, he went through, got a PhD here at Mines in the 2000s, and he actually came back and presented, I think, in 2013, an update. But his 06 paper that he was the principal author, given at the, the, key, the first Keystone meeting, is excellent, because it'll describe a lot of what 
the, the environment is from an pers individual perspective inside the mining industry. So those are two very, very good references that you, I won't say memorize them, but you should definitely should have a, <coughs> at least one good read. So what's happening right now? Shortage of talent at all levels due to the exiting of the baby boomers and decline in the number of new graduates in virtually all aspects of the industry. But that's one of the interesting things I found as, as some agencies responsible for the downstream part of the business say, like in Canada, there's a number. You can choose 80 or 100,000. We're going to need 80 or 100,000 know, people in 10 years. And I went by some of their booths, like at the Roundup, and I said, well, how many geologists is that? And they say, what's a geologist? <laughs> it's like, oh, we're not part of your statistics. You don't know what we do. And so it is very difficult to actually know what the number is that we have as would be considered as a target and how much the industry can sustain. Um, I think it's probably larger than is what's going through universities, but I don't really hear much discussion in the learned societies about that as to what the actual <coughs> Like, it shouldn't be a secret, it should be something that's actually talked about, but if large employers don't commit to saying they were going to have so many people employed over a certain period of time, you know how many truck drivers they need, or autonomous vehicles, mining engineers, metallurgical engineers, civil engineers, that don't seem to deal with very well with geoscience. So, you, you're in a bit of a quandary there. Um, lack of quality assets. There are quality assets out there, but most of them have got a shaft on them, or an open pit, and lots of trucks. And they're not really being replaced by the ones that are, are, being, are coming up, unfortunately. Poor long-term financial returns in most projects. Part of this is the industry's incredible ability to shoot itself in the foot. Many times, over and over again, many companies. Bad choices. That's why the company I work for, BHP, basically closed the office. I was in San Francisco. We basically made horrendously stupid financial decisions. Almost bordering on criminal. Almost bordering on criminal. <laughs> and uh, it was really amazing to watch. Um, it's like being in the Titanic, the only person with a life preserver. It's like, this is really interesting. Um, enormous global appetite is still there, so the drive Fundamentally, and Doug Silver, everybody flags that as being, yes, uh, India will, will at some point get it together and the middle class will, will burgeon as they are in China, and this will provide, for the next half century at least, lots of need for new raw materials and employment to go look for them. The departure looking at the individual points, the baby boomers leaving is inevitable, and with it a huge amount of experience. I wonder, if I went back to that graph on discovery though, what does that experience actually do for us? Because when we put 20 plus billion dollars through the system, with all of those experienced people guiding those programs, we seem to find less than we ever had. What went wrong. That doesn't get discussed much, and that's one of the things that geophysicists can ask, because we're numbers people, right? We're physics. We don't really believe in, in fate and, uh, and other things like that. We like to see pro underlying process and understand it. So that doesn't get discussed much, and so we have to look at the education of young geoscientists as being critical. And I think listening to Sarah's background is actually pretty awesome, because I believe we need more people coming in sideways into our business with different ideas, different backgrounds, different experiences than the classical education system, which hasn't changed much in the 19th century, really, in terms of our business, unfortunately. It may sound harsh, but there has to be something in our education system that needs to be improved. Getting that discussed will be an important thing. Lack of quality assets. Gold is a large part of what we go looking for. Grades have been falling. Uh, costs of production have been going up. So each ounce is, you know, is, is uh, you know, just all this discussion about what's the, what's the Fed going to do? 
what's the US currency, where's the US currency going? And at the end of the day, if we're dealing with marginal assets, we will focus on living at the edge all the time. We just don't have, unlike iron ore, we don't really have a robust environment. Diamonds, they've turned, and it was predicted by uh, Brian Hole's significant other at a course I attended here 10 years ago. If you can't find them, they're going to start making them, and that's what they're doing. They're making diamonds, and that's become part of that economic story because not enough good quality diamonds are being found. Just apparently they have to tell people that some are made and some aren't artificial. They're made by people, so they're not they artificial. Long-term returns. Um, there was a talk at the, I still call them Northwest Miners, but it's the, it's the mob that meets in Spokane and Reno, the AME, and uh, Bull uh, gave a talk in December, pleading, pleading for geoscientists, geologists to know more about economics, for their own protection, as well as the protection of other people. We have to get people listening to, like, what Brian McKenzie's course used to do for hundreds of people, and then Mike Doggett took it over for a while. Uh, Jeff Snow did it here. We've lost the people that actually will help educate geoscientists about the importance of economics. And I don't know why that piece was allowed to slip away, but it's, it, to me it seems to have vanished. And it's not that it, there aren't textbooks out there, but I think everybody has to pay more attention to how their, how their investors' money is being spent and is a good return, right down to when something's developed. The appetite for resources isn't going to go away, but we do find, like the largest, I think it is, undeveloped gold deposit in the world, Pebble, is still tortured, tortured by issues of access, land access. Is it the right thing to do? Doug Silver, in his talk two years ago, said, it doesn't matter how good Alaska looks on every other basis. He says, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is Pebble. You've got to figure out, figure out how to basically deal with it in a way that people believe you're not just hiding the issue. And I'm not sure what I've seen in the last uh, year and a half has actually helped or hindered in that process. But it's being talked about. We'll jump over this one. This is a good plot. Because this, from my perspective, is an important takeaway for you people in the room. Most of the deposits, the significant ones, that your employers your clients will be asking you to look for in the next 20 years are not going to be ones you're going to see in outcrop. They are deeper. The Australians have twigged on this. 80% of Australia is covered. And so the whole uncover initiative that they have there is about how to develop technologies and thought processes to explore undercover. We really quite haven't grasped that over here. We're still very much in love with the prospector myth. Stand on the outcrop, do the Chuck Fibke, do the day of lull. He will win the day. He will win the day. God bless. You know, that just isn't going to happen. And this, this was actually updated for Dan Wood's um, Jeff Henquist paper that's also in the January newsletter by, uh, by Shoddy. And see those green big green ones down there, those are all drilled by oil and gas people. They ran into mineral deposits at depth. We are, they're called the serendipity ones, right? That's cool. So, I mean, thank God we got guys with oil and gas budgets because we also got to drill down that deep, right? Man, that's awesome. So. A little bit about what my career was because, uh, like Sarah, you know, sort of you have to go look at the granularity of what goes on. So. There's the young me and the old me. In the beginning, it was pretty simple. Those two numbers were something I saw at the end of my first year at UBC down in the student placement office. And they were on little cards. And little cards basically said, geologist assistant, $425 a month. Geophysical assistant, $450. <laughs> I took that card. <laughs> that was it. And I actually read a history of Norm Keeble Jr. after he got his PhD. 
in his choice of what he was going to do was same thing. Who's paying more? It wasn't uh, wasn't any love of anything else. And like Sarah, I didn't have any family or any background. I'd been Boy Scouts. wasn't scared of the woods, but I didn't particularly love it. But uh, there you go. <laughs> that helped. The cycles. A lot rolled into here. It's almost 50 years. Those are the uh, the first uh, the orange and uh, yellow. We're all under one banner. I started with a company called Utah. We were then bought by GE for eight years as a hedge against inflation. Uh, a guy called Reg Jones figured that uh, with inflation rampant as it was in the 70s, natural resources would help them out. And then in 85, uh, GE sold the company lock, stock, and barrel, except the oil division, to BHP. And then I left them where they, the yellow turns into the kind of the blue. But when I sat down and actually looked at my career, I found that I had fairly major events about every three to four years, something happened. I job changed or I moved. And so rather than saying I had a fairly static existence, I actually had, in part, some of it would be self-induced or, you know, I made a choice, I put my hand up. Or I, I kicked somebody's shins and said, you know, you should send me somewhere else. <laughs> but these things all basically were part of the tapestry until I got here. This morning, I, I thought, that's an interesting plot. But the curve is what I call my satisfaction index. Mm -hmm. How well did I like what I was doing? And you can see, for the longest time inside BHP, I really wasn't that happy. But I had access to resources that nobody else did. We, we spent over $100 million developing an airborne gravity radiometer system, airborne EM systems. We had an instrument like a PIMA five years before PIMA was built, and it had a classification system inboard. These guys were building underground seismic equipment for the coal mines in Australia, and they were some of the smartest technologists in the world. And I could basically tell them what I wanted the company to spend the money on. But it didn't make me very happy. It was interesting, because right near the end, just as I saw the politics closing in, and I really was the last guy in the room. It was very funny <laughs> actually <laughs> saying that. Because the San Francisco office, which had been the old Utah office for, I don't know, 50 years, Hugo Dummett had these incredible Russian ge geology maps all over the walls. Hugo, we know, was going to go to San uh, Melbourne. It lasted a year and a half. I, was gonna, I got the choice of picking my 50th birthday when they were going to retrench me. They said, when do you want to go? And I said, well, why don't we pick my birthday? That seems appropriate. <laughs> and so all these wonderful geology maps, we were going to put in one of the guys who were going up to Vancouver in his uh, freight box. And um, this, this Australian, who I won't name him, but anyways, he caused enough damage. He wanders down the hall. And he says, Ken! They're like, I'm not going to imitate the Australian accent. He says, Ken, how's it going? I said, well, I'm you know, putting these... He says, oh, we've got a non-disclosure agreement you need to sign. And I thought, I've been working for this company for 27 years. On the last day of my existence here, you want me to sign a non-disclosure agreement? I thought, well, they could, re they could have held back my severance, so I signed it. <laughs> got to go to all the countries in the red. That was pretty cool. Um, what did I love? Solving problems. That to me was a, that a steady stream of really, not intractable things, but often things that were, you didn't really know if you had the, the right answer, but at least you could take it forward to the next step and make recommendations and engage your noodle in a way that uh, I think ultimately that's what I loved about the business. And it applies to a number of other things too in terms of hobbies and how you work with your family and the rest of it. Different people have different perspectives. Dave's got some uh, interesting and I think still relevant ideas. But, you know, as Sarah pointed out, not all geoscience is in the field. But um, Dave likes to keep, keep you out in the field. But you have to have money. You, have to have, you also have to have information. And that's one of the things. If you don't have the right information, how are you going to make good decisions? He doesn't really like geophysics much, high tech devices. To me, it's not the devices is the problem, it's the over-reliance on things that you disengage from. 
it's assuming because somebody's giving you a map with a bunch of numbers on it that they're right. Well, in a way, they are right, but it isn't necessarily relevant to the problem that you have. You have to take ownership of the problem and decide whether it's a geochemical technique, a geophysical technique, a remote sensing technique, or some, uh, you know, uh, fluid inclusion analysis, that it's there to basically solve a question that you have relating to the economic geology. And that should be, first and foremost, first thing you think of in the morning, last thing you think of at night. Be engaged. Take ownership of it. Then, those are your tools. It's just a tool. It's not a prediction. It's not a control. Anyways, Dave's stuff is there. It's great. I think the thing is, be prepared. Sarah touched on, you know, this three to five year mini careers is important. Uh, I had the benefit of staying inside one company. You sort of, you know, you get the same HR department all the time. Ah, that was really great. Real skin flints. But <laughs> these days, many more people are basically going to work as independent contractors. You are going to have to have uh, your spouse understanding the situation. <laughs> You were, I did not communicate to my spouse most of the years I worked. Uh, we're still together, which is amazing. But that, to me, was one of my biggest regrets, was not hiding things, but not discussing them. And basically letting her know what might happen. I do know that when we got the news that the job in San Francisco was over, it took us less than 10 minutes to figure out what we're going to do. So clearly I had a good relationship with her, we had a good relationship, but you have to work on that, and that's going to be critical going forward. So traditional field work, marketability is important, and core logging, you have to have, I think, basic knowledge in that. 3D modeling uh, is emerging, and it's very important. Uh, but don't be over-reliant on things like leapfrog or, or common earth models. <laughs> You've got, to, you've got to keep the beast under control. And there are people that, that have an over-reliance on technology, and some of them are not the technologists, they're the people who use it. Um, more integration, uh, that's just sort of, those are words that we speak, that we often don't translate them into actual action statements. Soft skills, Sarah mentioned the mobility, that's critical. Languages is, is very important social community relationships, and it's still a fascinating career. One thing I wanted to touch on, social license and some of the things we do, this is even still a very relevant problem. Uh, we know ballet is suffering enormously. Lots of money is being spent right now trying to investigate tailings dams. What really ticked me off was when this bozo wrote this letter into the Northern Miner and just basically, hey, it's not whether it's toxic or not, but it covered the earth with shit. <laughs> this is what goes on CNN, right? Duh. So I mean, having, you know, James, I'm sure, is a really good guy. Maybe he's known to some of you in the room. But you missed the point, James. That's not what this is about. We're not managing our social license. We're shredding it. Shredding it. And that, to me, is a problem. Mentoring is important. Still seems to be a real challenge going forward for young people to find mentors that they can effectively use. Some of the baby boomers are not that great using social media. Travel for mentoring can be important. Mini careers, I call it the geo Uber model, is probably going to be more common. Um, data integration will be a major and challenging issue and opportunity. If you're good at that, Visualizing in 3D, you're probably going to do well. Some new stuff coming out the door. It's fun. AI, drilling technology, keeping people in the loop. Uh, I'm not the smartest tool in the shed when it comes to AI. Uh, I see some things that looked interesting. The Gold Corp people and IBM have done some neat stuff at Red Lake. And hopefully we'll hear a bit more about that but it seems to be at a scale, at the mining scale, where you have enough data to control the beast. If you put it out into greenfields environments, it's still problematic. I think that AI is going to solve the problem of big data. 
we have to figure that one out with our gray matter before we turn it over to Watson. So, lots of incredible visuals come out of the AI world, but we have to watch where it's going. One neat thing that came out of Australia in the last uh, couple of years, started off actually in Alberta, tube drilling. Uh, this is basically trying to get a meter of drilling down to 50 bucks. Thing is, you give up getting core. It comes out as dust. I call it fairy dust. But the idea is you'll be able to test targets and learn about geology to depths at a cost that we have not been able to do before. Uh, they're looking at deploying this in the near future, a variety of settings. One of the things they will do, the, basically the drill bit here is actually an active motor, and so you're not having to push the rods down through the earth, but the system is actually pulling itself forward with the bit. Then you can also go in and do multi-parameter logging, along with the analysis you can perform on the, on the cuttings, or the dust that comes out of the, out of the hole, and this is how you will actually build up information. One of, the, one of the interesting points in discussing with some of my Australian colleagues is generally it's the lowest person on the totem pole is at the drill rig, the junior geo. With a scenario like this, they're going to be seeing the ore body before anybody else because he'll have real-time analysis. What is that person going to do? How are you going to empower them? Does he have a red phone to the chairman of the board? saying, we've just hit another Olympic dam? How are you going to tell the stock market about this information? When you generally have three to four months, you send it all over to ALS, and they just, you know, <laughs> sit around, you know, doing <laughs> social media stuff. They don't turn the stuff around, right? <laughs> the timelines that we used to expect for information are just going to go like that. You're going to collapse it down. My, my good friend and colleague, Robbie Rowe, who's worked on Uncover, he says, we've tried to talk to the Australian Stock Exchange, they can't absorb it. They have no concept of what to do with information that comes in that quickly. Interesting. So, if you can think of a good way to put yourself in that nexus, you could be have a freaking mining equivalent of a unicorn startup company, because lots of people are gonna have this problem don't know what to do about it, but they want to maintain control. How are they going to do that? Keep people in the loop, very, very important. Have to have time for discussion, have to have time to kick back. Actually, Dan Wood, it was funny. Some of you might have read his, his paper in January. It's fairly basic, but he covered a bunch of things. And I said, Dan, you know, one of the things that really bothers me is we don't talk enough about how much time it takes to actually think things through. And he says, when I was general manager, at, at uh, Newcrest, he said, I told my people they had to spend 20% of their time not doing anything. Feet on the desk. He actually put that in an email, but he didn't put it in his frickin', his, his, uh, his paper. And I thought, man, that would actually was, because here was a person who really understood the value of just thinking about stuff without necessarily an objective in mind. Associations, let things roll around in your so it's been done, and you know, under duress, a guy like Dan will actually admit it. But. So, disruptive mining. I think we have to keep the, you know, don't forget the people, and the, and the goodies will be forthcoming. So, anyways, I have to give thanks to Graham Kloss, who was uh, known to some of you. He's in emeritus status now, and uh, Lee Freeman and, and Paul Bartis. So thank you very much. Yes. Number one, this long-term trend that everybody talks about is being driven by two principal things, or three things actually. One of them is the environmental movement in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, when I got into the business, there were about 30 U.S. companies that down to five, and a lot of that is that you you can't explore or you actually can't develop and mine an metal deposit in most of the states today sort of doing that in Canada as well. The next thing is uh, the reality of developing, trying to put major amounts of money into a com country like Indonesia where they've just gone back to uh, Freeport and others and said, gee, we'd really like to have 52% of your mineral deposit. Guess what? 
So who the hell's going to invest money in a place like that? They did that in Mexico beginning in the 60s, and they had zero exploration there for about 40 years. <laughs> the next thing is, because I've been involved in sort of going back and forth between exploration, mineral development, and working in operating mines, is that uh, over the last many years, the equipment has gotten much bigger, gotten more efficient, fewer people, more computers, better mills, and so the head grades can go down, people can make the same amount of money. And the third thing is when, I, I worked for Dan Wood, and number one, he never told anybody to put their feet up and spend 20% of their time. He's full of shit if he's saying that. No, I'll tell you. That. It was the Australians that got to do it. <laughs> no, they didn't do it either, because I worked there too. Um, the next thing is that uh, when you start exploring deep targets and trying to mine them, just look at what's happening in resolution. They're going to have to mine that thing. Nobody knows how they're going to do it because the temperatures are so high. So there's a real problem doing that. So people are sticking to the surface, they're sticking to mines that they know about because number one, they're permitted. That's the big issue. All over the world is getting something permitted. They're sticking to countries where you can actually mine the thing in perpetuity, where you can invest a buck and not have some idiot government type say thank you and grab it. Uh, and so those are the factors driving it, really. And that's, that isn't going to go away. It isn't going to change. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just a fact. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the, None of those things are going to They're only I mean, going to get worse. Go governments control a lot of the agro that you're talking about. And it's certainly in their best interest not to have large hiatuses, you know, in, in, in cash flows and the rest of it. So if, if they're... But often, you know, if we stick with the, with the safe, the industry, the governments really aren't being pushed hard enough, I think, to resolve some of these issues, because you end up, uh, um, you know, the governments will, it's a squeaky wheel story. If, if you stop bugging them, they're going to go focus on something else. And, and right now, one of the things that's, that's popping up is pre-competitive data, which, of course, is the idea is that that, that too is changing around the world. I mean, industry has been generating massive amounts of geoscience uh, starting after World War II. And Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Would you invest 300,000 bucks of your own money in Russia going after a mineral deposit? Kinross is, is making money uh -huh. on Google? Would you personally do it? Uh, well, I guess I'd scale it with, I'd invest 30,000 because I think I have, that could afford 30,000. 300,000 would have to be You'd scale it. That's to it. But that's what companies do. They're, they're, when you go to some place like that, you're betting red 23. That's what it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> the idea is you get a partner that basically helps you de-risk it, right? There's things, there's things you can do to feel that you're, you're sharing the risk. You know, who otherwise you're exposing yourself to the enormity of the Kremlin with your 300,000, which doesn't that's really right. count for much. Or so. the Congress. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting because now Barrick is is uh, is is working with um, the government to promote gold, and I was reading uh, somebody else is exiting because of the taxes on copper. So that to me is a mixed message story, if I understand it right. So the government clearly has different sets of consultants, one in gold and one on copper, seemingly that are are sending uh, not a consistent message to natural resource development which ultimately, people will keep going back because the grades are so good, right? I mean, that to me, that's the bottom line in, in the Congo, is just that when you got 2.5% cobalt or <laughs> copper with cobalt credits, it's very difficult not to be a player in that environment. The objective is to make money. Exactly. <laughs> Ahead of your competitors, because that's limited opportunities. Where else do you go for something like that? So, yeah. Well, I think, you know, what some of the things you're talking about, this is where the soft skills part of it, uh, how to actually negotiate with whoever else is part of it, the stakeholders in the system, is something which the industry, you, you either go away in the corner and, and not negotiate, or you 
try and find people that actually are maybe doing a better job than you have historically, uh, and just accept the fact that the playing field has changed, um, so we have to change. Is, that, is there not an element of sensibility to that? Um, I At mean, the end of the day, you have to make money. Right? You have to yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Ken, yeah. Uh, what do you think of the rest of the periodic table in terms of uh, materials that are needed for uh, all the other things that are going on now? <clears throat> Lithium, of course, is a prime yeah. example, but there's a whole spectrum of other materials that are needed for what's going on now and for what's coming. What do you see happening now and what do you see happening in the future? Is it going to be significant? Well, I mean, a, a, a friend and colleague of mine, he's got a job with Fortescue now, but for a while he was developing a lithium story in Nevada. It seemed to have, there he was beside one producing operation. And it was interesting listening to him, uh, you know, Pat Heisman. He gave us a good talk at Dregs. And it really wasn't about discovery, right? It's about where you are and what the, what the making money, how to basically extract the product out in a shorter timeline and a lower cost than your competitors. Because there was no absence of lithium anywhere. The world, in a way, was awash of it. And some of it, you know, quite high grade, but then maybe with metallurgical issues. And I think that was the thing that Pat was emphasizing for his particular story was that they had a more efficient processing technique that could get the lithium out faster and cheaper with less contaminants than, say, somebody else. And, and that was what they were trying to raise their money on. He still wasn't successful. In the end, it, it, uh, it, it tanked. So that, to me, there's a lot of other elements out there that it's not technically a shortage of them or they don't have to be discovered. But you do have to find out an economic way to extract them, minimize the deleterious footprint part of it, and uh, uh, make make the buck that you're talking about. So we could, we can we're, we can be good at that as long as the rules don't keep changing. That's the problem. Yeah. No <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. So what do you need to get? Compliance, you know, greater awareness. I mean, I think historically we have an enormous awareness in the communities where mining is actually takes place. But you move away from those communities, you move into urban environments where the bulk of the voters are and the people that, you know, will elect the officials that determine policy. And there's like, they just don't grasp what, you know, and it used to be the trite one if you can't, you know, if you can't mine it, you have to grow it. You have to mine it. It's sort of like, yeah, it's true, but average Joe in, in suburbia doesn't have a mental model of that. And wh who, who's supposed to do that? Who's supposed to educate them? How do you actually get that buy-in with society? It's a different, it's not the mining engineers. I don't think you want them going door to door. God, I don't want to. But Ken, Across 2,500 years, it's never been easy, right? It's always been difficult, but these seemingly insurmountable problems have always been overcome somehow. I see that as a continuing trend. Yeah, I guess it's, it's we have, I mean, I think one of the things that the younger people face is a knowledge of, of our business in a way that, when I started, I had no clue what mine was. I didn't really know for the first 10 years. The big advantage I had was, more than most, is that, that Utah was starting a, a copper mine on Vancouver Island, just as I came up. So I actually got to see a mine at the very, very beginning. And before it was there, the, you know, the logging, the clear cut, the shaft was put down. So in a way, I had an advantage of that little microcosm. Because the rest of my career, you know, it was 15 years before, you know, I, I was in your prospects. I mean, we, oh, it was great. We worked on the posse thing in bloody central Brazil. And they're still talking about developing posse. It's this gold deposit, right? You know, Western mining had it, and now these jokers. So I saw a lot of things that never became mines or hadn't become mines yet. But I did see something at the front end. And how to get, basically, uh, young people educated in a way that 
like Sarah said, it's difficult to get that field experience. You're, you're, you're bringing in people into the business that don't have the same uh, sort of organic understanding of, of the industry that we were able to when we had, well, I, you know, I had three. When I graduated with a bachelor's degree, I had a year of experience. I could go out and basically, you know, clean and shoot a gun. I know how to build a tent. I knew how to sling a helicopter. And people these days, they haven't had that opportunity. And it's a different, it's a different model. And I don't think we can go back to that, but we have to figure out ways to, to what is important going forward that the industry really needs to make available to younger people that's important for them to learn, to be successful. And what's the environment they're working in? I, I mean, BHP stated they want a 50-50 gender balance by 2025. Now, that's not actually, to me, a strategic plan. It's a plan. But there's interesting, uh, really? Is that going to work? A buddy of mine sat down. Uh, he, was, he had worked for, for BHP after I did. And I think we did a back of an envelope and figured out, you know, how many, what the gender balance was, you know, that when they announced this like, five, six years ago, and how many people were in the company, and some, you know, sort of nominal growth rate and attrition rate and the rest of it. And it, I, think, I think we figured they had to take 2,600 men out each year and shoot them, uh, basically, to order to get that number. It just did, it didn't really add up. And then, of course, BHP says, well, it's a goal. It's not, it's not going to be a stated objective. But I mean, that, that's dealing with part of the future, but it doesn't, to me, say, what are those people going to be doing? What are the educational requirements? What is the knowledge base that they're going to have to draw from to be successful in that, in that company? Um, I don't know. Good questions. They should, be at, they should be talked about more, I think, rather than just Dave Lowell telling us minds are not found in the office. I don't know. I mean, you have to have an idea. Some of the best ideas are in the most uh, inappropriate places sometimes, you know? Sleeping. Wake up. Ah. Tony Berenger, when he was describing how he used to create a process, he says, I dreamed it. Tesla did the same thing, apparently. Tesla could dream details down to a patent definition. And he woke up and he could draw that patent. So, you know, accept diversity. We need more of it. So, anyways. Got some handouts, um, flyers here on technology that came out with the Northern Miner, but a lot of people don't subscribe to it. So, if you want to grab that, go for it. Well, thank so you. We're done. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Sarah. Yep. Yeah, <laughs>